hopeless. The alarm rang, 6.30 a.m. He turned it off and looked up at the ceiling. Am I living or surviving, he thought. After all, working 12 hours a day and going to college on the remaining time is not much of a life. I managed to get up after some time. He checked the time on his phone, 6.53. He's going to be late again. His boss will complain about him. This is a bad day after all, maybe the worst of the year, he talks to himself as he gets ready to leave without any emotion. He manages to get out of the house eventually. His house is four minutes from the bus stop. Time is around 7.20. He's not running because the bus goes around 7.28 at that stop. Just when I'm getting to the street, the bus goes by. It's too far to make it running. It's hopeless anyway. He's starting to think he's going to get busted. And he's starting to think about it. He starts thinking about why he does this, why he cares. He works at a crappy job that barely pays the bills anyway. His boss is the devil in person. The company buys the workers for $3 an hour and sells them for $15 an hour. He knows it. His position has access to such reports. Every time he remembers that the boss's son is his coworker and he receives better wages than him and doesn't do anything, he gets even more demotivated. He looks at his hand, he looks at his hands and thinks, I'm only here for her. If not for her, I would have left this planet already. He looks around. The bus stop got crowded without him noticing. He looks to the left, and the bus is coming. 7.44. His shift starts at 8 o'clock, and he's only taking the first bus. There's two more to go after this one. The bus stops. He gets in. Bus is crowded. The rest of the people get in, too. The bus feels like a tuna can. He observes the surroundings. There are people talking and laughing, people on the phone texting. Everyone seems so happy. Even the bus is at least one double maximum capacity. He sneaks his hand into his backpack. It's a hard task since he can barely move his arms. He grabs his headphones, plugs them in. Life gets 2% better. He does not hear the useless talking now. He's isolated. The bus arrives at the terminal. He rushes towards the next one. Just as before, another tuna can. It's midwinter. He left home with two coats. However, the amount of people produces extreme amounts of human heat. He's sweating already. He takes off the coats as he walks onto the bus. It's 8.03 already, and he's far from work. He's gotten to a point where he doesn't care anymore. Today is a bad day after all, just like yesterday. Time goes by. The bus leaves the terminal at 8.10. He is 10 minutes late already. The bus leaves only to stop a couple of meters ahead. Traffic. Intense traffic. It's peak hour. The city's grown insanely in population in the last 10 years. No roads were planned. Average speed is 20 kilometers an hour. His bus needs to cross the city to get to the other terminal. He feels like a gasoline doll. The bus starts and stops every 50 meters. His body waves left and right. This goes for about 30 minutes when he finally makes it to the other terminal. 8.40 now. He goes to where the last bus stops, looks at the board for the bus schedule. Last one left 8.35. Next one is 9.15 a.m. He's not mad, not sad. He does not feel anything at all. He feels empty with zero motivation and will. He sits and waits, watching people go by. There he is, an empty human being watching other empty human beings rushing towards their work just as he is. Maybe I shouldn't complain that much, is the thought that revolves around his mind. He just snaps out of his thoughts, gets a piece of paper and a pen, and then starts drawing the terminal structure. He starts with the pillars, big black metal bars, then proceeds to the ceiling. Metal bars installed in some kind of web shape. There are iron bars everywhere. He draws the signs. His bus arrives. He checks the time and it's 9.13. He hops inside the bus and gets a seat. This is the only bus that does not feel like a pressure cooker. He gives a small smile and remembers that he is hungry. Maybe that's why he made so many analogies with food. The bus starts and leaves the terminal. He's almost to hell. How I meet again. So I don't really know how to title this. Let me just begin. Back when I was a kid, I lived in Jacksonville, Florida. I loved it there till I was in the sixth grade. I moved around a lot too. The neighbor which I'm talking about owned a two-story house next to my family's one-story house. We lived in that house for a total of three years and then moved to a new neighborhood. During these three years, me and my brother rarely went outside. Our parents didn't like the idea. Besides, Studying to them was a higher priority than anything else, as they were first-generation immigrants and preferred us to get a good education. 
Anyway, here's where things get interesting. Our parents decided to go to Los Angeles, California. Fine by us. We didn't quite care where we lived, although it was difficult to say goodbye to all of those friends. After having lived two years in California, my mom decided to sign me and my brother up for an acting camp. There, I attended the 13 and under class, while my brother attended the 13 and older class. One of the days, we had an exercise where two people would tell a story, one made up and one real. Me and another guy convinced the teacher to let us both tell a true story. The story I chose coincidentally took place the few times I went outside in that neighborhood which I lived in for three years. In the story, I, for some reason, named both the city and state I lived in as well as the neighborhood. One of the girls who was in my class, my class had around 10 people, asked me after the fact came out that both stories were true. Firstly, she asked where I lived in that neighborhood. I told her right before the speed bump. Then she asked if my family grew things in our backyard to which I replied that was true too. And lastly, she asked if I had gone outside with my brother to play before, and I replied that was true as well. And as such, I managed to meet my neighbor who I never knew until now across the country in a small acting camp in a class of roughly 10 students. At first, I couldn't believe it myself. Maybe I had forgotten the actual name of the neighborhood and simply agreed with her because it sounded familiar. But everything she described was accurate. Her house was indeed two stories and ours one. We did indeed live with our grandparents. Me and my brother did indeed go outside sometimes. The addresses matched. The city and states matched. Of course, I was pretty dumbfounded with such a coincidence. What are the odds that two kids' parents decide to move across the country to, albeit a popular city, to roughly the same region in the city and sign their children up the same year to the same small acting camp? And what are the odds that I tell that story out of the many which I could have told? And the odds that I listed the city and state where I lived? Oh, and the girl pretty blatantly tried to flirt with me during that class. Didn't particularly like her, but she definitely had a crush on me. Quite touchy if you know what I mean. This is just some extra info at this point. When we did some games, she liked clinging to me or talking with me every chance she got. I was actually turning 13 very soon during that camp, and as such was far more mature than the 10 or 11 year olds in that class. I still remember one girl sitting in my lap against my protests because she wanted to win a game. Boy, did I feel flustered then. Well, it's always cool to reflect on the past, get that type of immaturity going again. Just thinking about it makes me think about luck and how awkward I was back then. Sad story from my life. I come back to school after the Christmas holidays and we have a new girl in our class. We don't talk much at first since she seems pretty introverted. Soon she joins my friend group and we start talking a lot more. I discover she's a gamer girl and we transition into talking a lot on Discord too. We talk a lot, sometimes four to six hours on calls until 2 a.m. I get to know her. She seems really nice and I get an illusion that I might have a chance of dating her. We carry on being friends for a month with a small, insignificant argument here and there about things like not caring about each other or not being honest when we annoy each other. We get pretty close and become best friends. She tells me things about her never having a crush, which is understandable since she's young and gets on better with boys than girls. Anyway, we kind of start arguing more frequently for stupid reasons. I admit I was responsible for about half, but once we get that far, she wants to end the friendship, and I go along. We have a pretty deep discussion ending in us realizing we can't replace each other and realizing we have to let go. She asked things like, why do you care for me? So far, we've only been arguing online and acting normal or avoiding each other in real life. Well, that was about to change. The next morning, she messages me with the idea of, let's not talk over messages and just talk in real life, since everything's okay in real life. I go along since I don't want to lose her as a friend, and that argument was generally stupid. So everything goes normal for the next couple of weeks, and one week, it gets serious. It was a normal day at school. I came back home, and I felt that things were different. We didn't talk much now because of the arguments, I really didn't enjoy being with her, and I decided to write her some message describing how attached I was, how two-faced she acted, acting normal in real life, but then saying dumb stuff in arguments, how much I didn't want to argue, and that something had to change. Well, it turned out to be a 960-word message. Her response was pathetic. Furthermore, I found out she was annoyed by me expressing my emotions. For time's sake, I can summarize her response. Okay, but okay, don't suppress your emotions. I didn't expect this. I expected some kind of understanding. 
Once again, one morning, we get into some argument. She explains her lack of interest as a lack of human emotion when I tried to understand what is wrong with her like what I did wrong. I didn't understand why we didn't understand each other. Things were about to escalate. Right now, I feel clueless and very confused not knowing what the best thing to do is. I keep messaging her and trying to figure things out, to understand her at the very least. We get to a very dodgy area. She starts saying things like, You think I would ask for someone to care about me? No, I want everyone to forget about me, so I can finally effing kill myself without hurting anyone. That was when things started to head south. I took it as some sort of joke at first. She joked about suicide a lot before, but now I was a bit concerned. Later, she sends the message of, You want to see my arm? Oh no, you will think it's an attention-seeking thing. I go along. She sends a pic of her arm scratched to near bleeding. As I later found out, it's not the first year of her doing this. Just before, it wasn't as severe. I felt bad like anyone would. The same day after school, I message her that I feel bad. I know it wasn't because of me, but the least I could have done is be there for you and not annoy you with arguments. My feelings didn't matter at that point because she was my best friend for a while and I wanted to help. We message a bit. She's very hostile. I want to help. She doesn't take it. I ask why she says it's none of my business. It was my business. If it wasn't, I wouldn't feel bad. She says, just because I showed you a picture of my arm, you don't have to start pretending you feel bad for me. Introduce SB, suicide buddy, or her now best friend. SB is a 13 to 14 year old male that attempted suicide last year in the previous grade and is now her best friend. She said things like, because if I died, you wouldn't care. I just need to get my family to stop caring. Then, SB, then I can be free. Is that enough escalation? No, it's about to get much worse. From the previous conversation, I realized she was really suicidal or was trying to fake it. It seemed fake to me at the time because she had no reason to do it. She had friends, she had family. Turns out she had to go to a therapist a couple of years ago for the same reason. I still don't know. Probably those scratches were from a year ago. She tells me she's a very morbid person and there's nothing wrong. I start realizing that I can't help her. I'm clueless about what to do, so me, being the idiot I am, keep messaging her. It's us discussing how she was a B to me, and she's agreeing, discussing how she's very fake, and her incapability to feel human emotions like remorse, happiness, and love. I realize she's been through many things and that I am helpless, and nothing can change her past. The only thing that can be changed is her attitude. It's never late to start again. Trust people again. Feel happy again. I explain this to her as a last-ditch attempt. Well, guess what? That only made her laugh, and it backfired on me. Backfired on me, you'd ask? Yes. We were discussing how I didn't know what led to this lifestyle when out of the blue she sends me an interesting image. An image of a girl ran over by a truck with all her vital organs just out in the open. I feel disgusted by just remembering it. She found it interesting from a biological point of view. Being very creeped out, I try to explain how she's not normal. How looking at those kinds of things isn't okay. I ask her, what if she was that girl? And this is what frightened me the most in her response. She said, what dies or experiences the pain? If I deserved the pain, I'd do it. The next couple of days was us arguing about her being sociopathic, feeding on people's emotions and having a lot in common with SB. SB is even more effed up than her. According to one of my friends, they watch strange types of hentai together. The next day, I come home to about 20 messages, reading something like, how do you want me to kill myself? I tell her I don't want her to die. I regret knowing her and that I hope she becomes normal, but without me being her best friend. This escalates to her sending more of those images, which I prefer not to describe. It's some not safe for life content. I don't know where she got them from and I'm grateful she stopped sending them. Furthermore, it gets out of hand to the point where she begs me not to tell the school about it because she doesn't want to go to a therapist again. Three days later, last day of school before quarantine, we message under the table in class for a bit. I got some emotions out of her. I made her realize what kind of person she is, and she admitted. However, she is too weak to change and has adapted to this lifestyle. To conclude, what I'm left with is someone I wish I had never met in my friend group. Someone I had feelings for, but now every thought of her makes me feel disgusted. Thanks to the quarantine, I don't have to see her anytime soon. What do you guys think?